Hello, I hear we are live. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today at this panel from the City of London uh, with new financials, new report on Capital Markets Union. Very excited that we are going to have Will Wright, one of the authors of the report, walk us through this today. Um, William Wright is a friend of most of us in the financial services research community and as someone whose work I have respected for a long time and I'm really delighted to be here on the panel with him today. Um, then we have a wonderful discussion lined up. I do apologize that um, Isabel Benumea from the European Parliament was not able to join us today. She had a conflict come up at the last minute. That said, we are still going to have a great discussion. This is being recorded, I should let you all know. And also, as you can see, I'm sure you've been on a Zoom webinar before, we have a Q&A ability for those of you in the audience to ask questions. So I would invite you at any time, stick your questions in the Q&A. We will, depending on how many there are, either read them or consolidate them. If you'd like to identify yourself, that's always nice um, since we can't see you. And with that, I will um, turn it over to our panelists to start the event. We have William first presenting the report. Then we have Katarzyna Schwartz from the Polish Ministry of Finance, Urban Funored from the Swedish Securities Market Association, and Koya Gabriel um, representing the Association of German Banks. Thank you all very much for coming today. We'll be with you till about 4.15 uh, Brussels time. Thanks. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. Um, can you hear me now? Excellent. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you to my fellow, fellow panelists for joining today. Uh, thank you to the City of London Corporation for hosting this event. And thank you to all of you for joining. Apologies uh, for the momentary uh, technological breakdown. It was working perfectly two minutes ago. Um, my name is William Wright. I'm the founder of New Financial, and we make the case for bigger and better capital markets in Europe. Now, as a lot of you know, when we're talking about capital markets union and the future of EU capital markets, it's very, very easy to get lost very quickly in the detail of the double volume trading caps and so on. Um, so in our most recent report, A New Vision for EU Capital Markets, we wanted to make sure that we keep half an eye on the bigger picture and the longer term vision. So what I'm going to do today, instead of walking you through page by page through the report, I want to ask three very big and very simple questions. Firstly, what are the big challenges that we need European capital markets to help us address? Secondly, and I think this is the big question, in their current form, are EU capital markets in a position to address those challenges? And thirdly, if the answer to that question is no, and I think in most cases the answer probably is no, um, then what are the big levers that we can pull to help change this? So if we start with these big social and economical and increasingly environmental challenges that we need capital markets in the EU to help address. Um, there's a lot, but I think here are so four or five of the big ones, uh, obviously helping to support the huge amount of financing that we will need uh, in the EU to support the transition to net zero. We've got financing innovation and growth at scale to help drive job creation across the EU, providing a more diverse range of finance uh, so that European companies are not entirely reliant on bank lending. Uh, I think a bigger picture one, helping project the EU on the global stage as an economic, political, and regulatory superpower. And of course, supporting an aging population and addressing the demographic challenges faced by the EU and helping millions of EU citizens invest in their future. And I think it's important to to make clear, you know, these problems are not new, but these problems are not going to go away. And every day that the EU chooses not to fully address these problems, the cost of addressing them goes up. So what about the second question? Well, are EU capital markets in a position to address these problems? And I think this is another way of asking, does the EU have strategic autonomy in capital markets? And at every turn, whichever sector you look at, whichever metric you use, despite some welcome progress over the past decade uh, and since the launch of CMU, we keep coming back to the fact that the answer in most cases is no, EU capital markets are not yet 
in a position to help address these challenges. Today, EU capital markets are still relatively small. We all know that. Underdeveloped relative to GDP, we know that too. Highly fragmented uh, and shrinking in global terms. And just a data point on the shrinking in global terms, since 2006, the year before the global financial crisis really got going, the EU 27's share of global capital markets activity has nearly halved from 19% of global activity to just 11%. So what that means, I think, is that EU companies, EU investors, and EU citizens are at a competitive disadvantage. And that in future, the EU is going to struggle to shape global standards and project its values on the global stage. Let's have a quick look at these challenges one by one. And if we start with sustainable finance and net zero, it's fantastic news that the EU is clearly a global leader in sustainable finance. Um, over the past year, roughly 20% or more than 20% of all bond issuance by EU issuers was labeled green or ESG. And that accounts for over 40% of global activity. But even if we assume that all of this green money being raised in the EU is genuinely green, uh, and I think uh, we're all aware that that might be quite a big if, um, then we're still a very long way short of the sort of funding that we need. When we think about the EU capital markets ability to provide finance for innovation and growth at scale, we immediately run into a problem that venture capital markets, public equity markets in the EU broadly speaking, are anything from a fifth to a third the size relative to GDP as they are in comparable markets, comparable economies, and are not able to provide the scale of funding required by high potential EU growth companies. So that helps explain why EU success stories like BioNTech, Spotify, Avast, Trustpilot have instead turned to the US or the UK to raise money. Now, from a sort of strategic autonomy perspective, there's nothing wrong with companies choosing where to raise money, but it really should be a choice and not the only available option. If we think about providing a diverse range of funding for EU companies, here's a great example of where the EU has made progress. EU companies' reliance on bank lending has gone from 85% of their borrowing 10 years ago to just 75% today. But that still leaves EU companies heavily exposed to a fragmented banking system that is really still struggling in the wake of the financial crisis and of course, more recently, the COVID pandemic. And finally, on the final challenge, you know, what about supporting an aging population? Um, and this is what we call, you know, this is the C in CMU, capital. And the basic problem here is that the EU doesn't have enough of it. Uh, aside from uh, a small number of countries with big, deep pools of long-term capital, um, across the EU, these pools of capital simply aren't big enough to address these challenges. And without reform, it could leave the EU reliant on international capital with all of the social and political strings that may come attached with that. And again, I can't stress enough, there's nothing wrong with international capital, but it should be a choice, not the only available option. So that's the sort of the starting point of the, the bad news in the report. The good news in the report is that we think there is absolutely nothing intrinsic to being in the EU that means that you cannot have deep, effective, efficient capital markets. Uh, just ask the Netherlands, ask Sweden, ask Denmark, ask France. In other good news, the EU doesn't need to try to turn itself into the UK or the US, and you know, there are plenty of reasons why it might not want to try to do that, but it doesn't need to in order to make real progress in capital markets. At the core of this report, we, we measured member states in the EU against each other and identified an ambitious but we think achievable growth opportunity uh, in EU capital markets. To be clear, we're not saying what these markets would look like if everybody had capital markets like Sweden or like the Netherlands. We're saying, what would they look like if everybody just moved up a little bit? And some of the numbers that come out of that, we see pools of long-term capital more than doubling, injecting potentially around 14 trillion euros into the EU economy. There would be roughly twice as many listed companies as there are today. 
Uh, and that would take EU stock markets back to the same share of global activity that they enjoyed in 2006. Um, there could be an additional 200 uh, EU companies a year raising money in IPOs and more than 3,000 additional companies a year uh, being backed by venture capital. But we all know that sort of growth isn't going to happen on its own. It's not going to happen overnight. What we're trying to stress in this report is it's not going to happen by adjusting the double, the double volume trading cap uh, under MIFID II. It's not going to happen by adjusting the detail. I'm going to finish in three big levers that I think could help. So the first of these is that we strongly believe in New Financial that, that pushing ahead with EU capital markets, deeper, more effective capital markets union, there's a huge amount, well, there's a trade-off between top-down measures that are taken at an EU level and bottom-up measures that can be taken uh, at a national level. While EU-wide harmonization is welcome, there's a huge amount that individual member states can do to increase capacity, uh, whether it's financing scale-ups, uh, addressing the tax differential between debt and equity, or pensions reform. And they can do that, as a number of countries have, without having to wait for all 26 of their friends and neighbors to agree with them. I'll give you one very small example. This week, for the first time, EU citizens are able to start saving for their retirement through a PEP, a pan-European pension product. That's great. It's a fantastic step forward. But PEPs have been seven years in the making. Over those seven years, the Netherlands alone has added more than 600 billion euros in pensions assets. That's roughly what PEPs are forecast to generate um, in the next decade. The second big lever, I think, is that it's going to take renewed political commitment. That means taking some bold steps. Years ago, I remember Olivier Gasson when he was uh, director general of DG FISMA, saying that one of the problems in his view as to why it's struggling to get member state buy-in to CMU was that there was a lack of a sense of crisis. But I wonder now how much more of a sense of crisis the EU needs in light of Brexit, the COVID pandemic, and most recently the terrible war in Ukraine. And third, this is going to involve trade-offs. If the EU really wants the sort of capital markets that I think it needs, that I think many people across the EU believe it needs, individual member states are gonna to have to accept that they won't be able to have the sort of capital markets that they want. You cannot have the sort of capital markets that the EU needs with 27 different versions of the single rule book or 27 different market supervisors. You can't build a world-class equity market with 27 different national equity markets across the EU. Something, something is gonna to have to give. And if we accept that these challenges are important, if the EU accepts that capital markets aren't able to address them, um, what are they going to do about it? What are policymakers, regulators at an EU level and member state level, what are they going to tell their children, their grandchildren in 20 or 30 years time when they ask why the EU couldn't find the money to address climate change, why they have to work longer for a less generous pension? or why they're poorer than their peers in Asia and the Americas. I don't think a good enough answer is we couldn't agree on the listing and trading rules for dozens of exchanges across the EU, or we couldn't put aside our differences on investment fund distribution rules uh, in different member states. Um, and sooner or later, if the EU doesn't take action and member states don't buy in to the concept of capital markets union, Perhaps they're going to have to admit that they just didn't do what they knew they needed to do when they needed to do it. Thank you for your time today. That's a quick walkthrough of the key themes uh, of the report. And I look forward to the discussion with all of you and with my fellow panelists. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank Rebecca, you so much. Great overview. I appreciate your walking us through us. And I'm not sorry I'm muted, so I wouldn't and mess you up. Uh, next we go to Katarzyna coming to us from Poland. Yes, th thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, for the introduction. Thank you for uh, for the invitation to today's panel. I'm really happy to be to be here. Uh, and of course, Will, thank you so much for this uh, for this overview of the report that I've read in uh, with with interest. 
Um, not only because I found a lot of inspiration there for us as the government, uh, but also um, because I was really happy to see that a number of recommendations uh, in the report we are, uh, we are already doing. Um, so perhaps a brief overview of, uh, of that. Uh, Poland, as you know, is a country with a shorter capitalist tradition and our capital market is smaller than in France or in the Netherlands. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, with the market cap at 35% of our GDP and over 800 listed companies on the exchange, uh, we are still uh, the biggest market in the CEE region. Uh, Poland attracts a lot of uh, foreign investors. Uh, they are responsible for uh, over half of the stock exchange's turnover. Um, and uh, the stock exchange also hosts a number of foreign companies from Czechia, Ukraine, but also, interestingly, uh, from, uh, from the UK. Uh, so crucially, um, also, uh, also important to mention that um, almost half of private equity event and venture capital funds uh, invested uh, in the CE region uh, end, up, uh, end up in Poland. So the intention of, of the government uh, here is to really build on these strengths. And this is why uh, since 2020, we are pursuing our strategy for capital market development uh, meant to transform our capital market into one uh, that not only benefits from, uh, but also can contribute to uh, the capital markets union, uh, perhaps as a regional hub. Our first objective, something that was very uh, very visible and emphasized in the report is to turn more savings into investments. So that is why we introduced uh, just a couple of years ago an automatic enrollment employee capital plans uh, with a welcome bonus for the government, whereby part of the employee's uh, pension savings are invested in, in the capital markets. Uh, the participation is rising steadily. Uh, and there is now almost uh, 8 billion Polish latte equivalent to over 1.5 billion euro uh, in their accounts. Secondly, uh, we are decreasing our economy's dependence on the banking sector and, creative, and trying to create um, attractive conditions uh, for the capital markets to grow. So something that would also allow, uh, for example, private equity funds uh, to exit their investments more smoothly and quickly if they so uh, decide. Uh, this year, we've introduced fiscal incentives for companies considering an IPO. Uh, so if you pay taxes in Poland as a company, you will be able to deduct 150% uh, of your IPO costs from the tax base for the, purpose, for the purposes of, uh, of calculating your tax. Um, on the other hand, we're also uh, promoting individual investors' participation uh, in the market on a long-term basis. So investors um, who buy shares at the IPO uh, and hold them for at least three years uh, will not have to pay the capital gains tax once they decide to exit. Again, this is, uh, this is not only to promote individual investors as part of our capital market, but also um, to, um, to emphasize something that in the report is referred to as patient capital. I think this is a really nice term. Um, with these reforms, uh, we intend to become a truly modern, modern and um, vibrant financial center within the CMU. And we know that uh, for that, we also need to attract talent. So this is why we introduced uh, also another attractive tax incentive for people working in um, capital markets outside Poland to move here and help us develop. Uh, we know that uh, Brexit, for example, has prompted people uh, to rethink, reconsider their career paths. And our message is you're really welcome here. We need you and we need you to help us uh, build our capital market and develop it. We are also working closely uh, with our financial regulator uh, to streamline the administrative procedures uh, and limit gold plating uh, in response to, um, to, the, concer uh, to the concerns um, flagged to us by our capital market participants. So um, also as part of the strategy, um, a dedicated capital market court uh, is to be established in order to uh, ensure professional uh, judicial, judicial service uh, to, to capital market participants. Uh, 
Um, last but not least, and something that is very close to my heart indeed, uh, we want our capital markets to help us finance the most pressing challenges uh, of today, such as climate change uh, and climate transition. Uh, so everyone knows that uh, Poland uh, or that the Polish economy relies heavily on coal. But not everyone knows uh, that Poland was indeed the first country to issue a sovereign green bond. Um, we have uh, a lot of corporate, uh, a rising corporate uh, green bond issuance and some municipal uh, green bonds as well. And our recent analysis indicates that there is enormous potential for, uh, for these types of instruments in Poland, not only in terms of domestic issuance, but also uh, hosting issuers from other countries uh, um, on our exchange or offering certification services and everything around uh, green bonds, such as data analytics. Um, and this is why in spring this year, uh, we will start working on a sustainable finance roadmap for Poland to be sure that uh, we can make the best of the opportunities also mentioned in, uh, in Will's report. So here's a brief overview of what we're doing. There are 90 points within the strategy, so I'm not going to bore you with uh, all of them, but I'm very happy to, uh, to discuss them and take any questions. Thanks very much, uh, Urban. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, William, for an excellent uh, report and to Katarzyna for uh, making some really, really good uh, remarks here about the Polish example. Um, as for the report, I think it makes several very good points and, of course, provides lots of good data and statistics. And I think it also shows, as you say, that we have quite a lot of work to do on the CMU project. Um, and I think when it comes to the uh, present plan, the second CMU action plan, I think in a way it, it does contain quite a lot of good action points. Um, that are you know, some pan-European, some more kind of oriented to us, the, the member states. Uh, we have the initiative and the, the about to make listings easier, for example, especially for SMEs. Uh, we have the initiatives together with the OECD to increase financial literacy, both generally and with a focus on the younger generation. Uh, some work is attempted on, on the withholding taxes issue, which we know is a problem. And above all, uh, while some of this is aimed at retail investors, there are also these actions aimed at banks and insurers to invest more in capital markets. Uh, that being said, uh, of course, we wouldn't be in the EU if we couldn't find uh, some kind of dark spots on the moon. Um, and I think, for example, the European single access point, where I think all respondents to the consultation said that let's focus on sustainability data, for example. Well, the commission issued and published something completely different, as we all know. Uh, so that's kind of more, uh, they're a bit off track there. Uh, but I think the, the question uh, that William so uh, in a great way points out in his report is, you know, do we still have a momentum in the CMU and can we do more? Uh, well, if there is ever to be a CMU3, even if we know that sequels rarely get better, um, so hopefully we will find another name for the next project. Uh, I'm sure we can do more. Um, and, uh, but on the one hand, I think some of the actions that we are taking right now, like on withholding taxes and listings, etc., they will take time. Uh, and it's also, you know, it's great that they got started on them. But as Katarzyna, as you say, uh, and what you really point to is also the question, is the CMU as kind of an EU project losing momentum because it has turned into an EU only project? Uh, again, I think there are quite a number of good uh, actions, but as William mentioned, the PEP, for example, which I worked on uh, in, in the old days, took seven years will likely not be a, a success uh, ever. So the question is really, do we have true buy-in from member states? If we set aside these statements in the ECOFIN minutes that ministers never read, but they are provided by the commission, I think what, they, what you are doing in Poland, for example, shows what you can do uh, at, at the national level. 
And I think I'm a true believer personally, having spent a number of years in Brussels, I'm a true believer in EU initiatives where it makes a difference. But the fact is, and as William also points out, uh, the countries that are you know, described as best in class, like France, Sweden, the Netherlands, we all had uh, you know, really good, well-developed capital markets before the CMU. This is again, not to say that the CMU is bad. On the contrary, it does contain quite a number of good initiatives, but I'm quite sure that you know, the Polish initiatives are there because you took a stand and you wanted to do something in Poland. And then again, we can share best practices, et cetera, with the help of the EU, but you are doing this because you're, you want to promote kind of the national market, right? It's not the CMU that started it. And I think we have a similar experience in, in Sweden that while, as you can tell from the report, Swedes own a lot of stocks, lots of investment funds. We have quite a large interest in capital markets. Uh, and we very much started in the way that you are doing in Poland now, uh, you know, with tax incentives for investments in, in the mutual funds. Uh, actually, the government set up in mutual funds to nationalize more or less part of the ownership. And this, that was then distributed, you know, under a conservative government. I did myself work on a number of privatizations of state-owned enterprises. They listed them, they took them public and promoted the shares at a good price to the public. That, so that is, and in, in addition, we had Ericsson, for example, you know, making it uh, quite inexpensive to buy mobiles, you know, buy tablets, et cetera, et cetera. So the country's very much digitalized. At the same time, also in Sweden, most retail investors do their business via regional or national or local banks and brokers. Uh, the large share, large share of, of investments made by Swedish investors are still in Swedish, Nordic and US stocks in that order. Uh, even if many of course also invest in global and European, et cetera, uh, mutual funds. Uh, they also invest in, in stocks. I, I had a discussion with a member yesterday. We do have uh, people investing in Polish stocks, in German stocks, et cetera, that are compared to Swedish stocks. You know, they have a very good valuation uh, based on what, what the companies are actually doing. Uh, we even have people investing in Italian stocks, even if we know that it takes a long time to, to get the withholding tax out, out of the country. Uh, similarly, when it comes to IPOs, and you can tell from the report that Sweden has a quite a large share of, of, I, of the EU IPOs. Still, I, I worked in, in a previous life on a number of those. Uh, most of them were Swedish IPOs, Swedish companies. You do have the Spotify type of companies where we either lost them from Sweden because they went to the US, but in many cases, we had uh, regional or local investment banks and advisors working on them. And I'm quite sure that my members, the local regional investment banks, they can absolutely share best practice and experiences with Poland or Austria or Germany or whatever, but it will be bankers from those countries who know the local market, who will have to kind of develop uh, those uh, background, those, those markets as well. So I think when, uh, when we're discussing about the polycentric financial centers, there are some areas where we can share best practices and do quite a lot at a, a European level. But I think we need to do a bit more as William would phrase it, kind of on a bottoms up approach to make sure that we support national, uh, local, regional markets. Because if we are to get people to get, take money out of their bank accounts and invest, you know, they may not do that and put the money into kind of a global in, uh, mutual fund. They may be more interested in investing in a Polish startup, you know, that they have read about in the paper where they can meet with the founders and kind of where if successful, you know, it can bring a success to, to the national and local market. So I think there's a bit too much of the kind of pan-European discussion and EU-wide uh, supervision part of the CMU. And we need to look more at what we can do at member state level, again, with the support of, of, of the commission and ESMA, who are doing a great job. 
And then as we're soon uh, uh, handing over to, to the banking side, I can also say that quite a number of the investment banks and brokers in Sweden are part of commercial banking groups. So in my world, it's not banking or capital markets. It's actually both. I mean, the banks have a really important role to play here. And the banks themselves, it's in their own interest to make sure that companies that they lend money to also have a good share capital to, to fall back on. So I leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks very much. And Koya. Yeah, um, thanks a lot, Rebecca. And uh, Orban, I couldn't agree more. Uh, actually, uh, we uh, actually, as uh, the Association of, of Commercial Banks in, in Germany, see a lot of potential in the Capital Markets Union and have supported the initiative uh, from the beginning when it was presented by Commissioner Hill seven years ago. And um, also, thanks a lot, William, actually, for, for your study, uh, the new financial study, which actually gives a very good overview, uh, um, actually, on the situation we are we are facing in the in the EU. And um, I think um, it's totally right to say that there are some markets more developed and some some less. But um, this was mentioned by you, William. Uh, it's of course true that uh, if uh, there is no crisis or if there is no actually push, um, many uh, actually players uh, stick to what they know and what is working. And looking at the German market, um, looking at corporate finance uh, and seeing also, of course, the figures of your report, uh, which show that more than 80% uh, actually of corporate finance uh, goes via uh, bank lending, um, shows that this has worked in the, in the past. In particular for SMEs, um, bigger corporates actually know their ways actually also to use other uh, sources and are globally engaged and are actually also engaged on capital markets. This doesn't mean that this is right and this should stay like that, but for the time being, it has worked. So this is something I think we have to, to, to see here. But uh, um, as Orban said, actually, banks should also play an important role in uh, building up uh, and actually also in supporting uh, the, the, the capital markets union. Um, we see in the report actually that Germany is in this uh, second group of uh, countries. It's actually uh, not on the most developed side. It's actually on the relatively developed uh, among the relatively developed capital markets. And uh, as I said, this is this is due to this broad range also of banks which are existing in, in, in Germany and which are in particular also specialized on, on SMEs who work actually with their house banks uh, sometimes since generations. So uh, that's why uh, it's, 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 it's a model, but it's not enough actually. All these challenges coming up uh, were mentioned already. It's a transformation into a actually more digital and sustainable economy. It's actually a COVID crisis. It's uh, also the crisis we are facing now uh, with, with, with the war in the Ukraine, uh, that we have to act now. And this might be actually the push Gerson was looking for, actually. Uh, and I think this was uh, once uh, said by Juncker, uh, the EU actually always goes for more integration in times of crisis. And uh, we have seen that also during the COVID crisis that reforms were possible, which we wouldn't have thought uh, about earlier that this could be done. Looking actually at the, uh, for example, the capital markets recovery package, which uh, introduced, for example, in the field of securitization, also uh, synthetic securitization, which was, controversially debated year for years and suddenly it was possible. So um, this shows that actually uh, the stakeholders can learn and can overcome also um, yeah, their critical views and, and um, find a good, good compromises. So I would be a little bit more optimistic here, although it's 
taking time it's true um, but but uh, um, it's it's possible and what you said katarina is also true it should be a complementary approach by the member states it's right that the member states have to work on their reforms and actually create incentives for investors and make their markets interesting but this should be done, of course, also uh, in cooperation with with the EU level, because this is also mentioned was also mentioned by William that you need not a totally fragmented set of of, of rules and and markets. You would need actually uh, also a bigger market which uh, works also also cross border. One more point I would like I would like to mention is, um, um, and this is also part of the of the study, the investment of households. And and in Germany, it's it's a big issue. Germans love their deposits. Uh, this is due to the ups and downs of, of the German history uh, in, in, the, in the last century, and uh, they actually prefer stability over, over taking risks. But this is changing slowly. So with new generations, you actually also see a growing risk appetite, and that's why it's necessary that we actually also invest in financial literacy. And uh, we, as, as Association of German Banks, the BDB, uh, has started a number of initiatives uh, for example, one on, on business and youth, uh, together with the uh, newspaper uh, FAZ, which actually um, is interesting for pupils and students who start reading uh, articles and do analyzes and then actually do their own articles. So they understand how the economy works and, and, and also actually contribute uh, um, with 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 articles and uh, the best articles uh, will win a prize and 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 at our last ceremony we had actually the chance to have Commissioner McGuinness as keynote speaker because this is a topic she uh, has put very high on the agenda. So this is also something which can be found in this uh, latest uh, Commission action plan on capital markets union. And uh, we welcome, actually, uh, that she wants to put more efforts in this field, too. So maybe so much for my side for the time being. Thank you so much for that. And I'm glad we're talking about the range of everything from getting capital off the sidelines to financial literacy to the role of the justice system. I have a lot of CMU follow-up questions, but we have an audience question already, and it's a very good one for our time. So I will go ahead and ask that for William. Um, the question is, how bad a setback to a relaunched capital markets union is the current security crisis? Does this bring more risk aversion? Does this encourage member states to be more cautious than they might otherwise? Is it gonna change anything? Um, I, I, it's literally the multi-trillion euro <laughs> question, isn't it? Um, I would like to be optimistic on this question. In the very short term, I think the challenge with the, the current crisis is that obviously there are security, defense, more existential and immediate challenges that have pushed up the, the political agenda, which should probably will push CMU down the political agenda a few more notches. On the other hand, I think that the current crisis should help put things a little bit in perspective. And that instead of arguing over the detail of the differences in the tiny differences in regulation between supervisor A and supervisor B, which effectively mean that a stock exchange, which is uh, a national stock exchange, which is owned by the same stock exchange group, is effectively operating, you have two markets operating as, as separate markets because of these tiny little differences. So what I would hope is that it, it will underline the, the imperative of ensuring that e, the EU at an EU level and member states are doing everything they possibly can to ensure that the EU has the strongest, most resilient, most dynamic economy it can have. And it can't have that sort of economy uh, without bigger, deeper capital markets. So hopefully in the medium term, it'll be a positive. Thanks for that. The uh, follow-up I wanted to ask you was on the 
court question that came up in Katarzyna's comments. One thing I've heard repeatedly over the years is that the huge variety of bankruptcy laws and even just property claims, like how do you, how do you ensure collateral repossession and sorts of things, is one of the biggest uh, barriers to cross-border investment. And of course, it's very hard to standardize. So could you have a limited capital market court in all of the member states or across the member states that might be able to reduce these kinds of disparities? Is that addressed to me or? or it or, is, uh, it Kathy? is. You're the big picture guy. I want to know the big picture version of this. I, I think the danger of that approach, I mean, what I found really, really positive and encouraging from listening to Katrina's presentation to Urban, to, 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 to Kolya, is this real emphasis on let's not wait for the EU to solve this for us. Let's not wait. Let's not turn this into uh, an EU-wide harmonization project because there is plenty more that can be done at the same time uh, from a bottom up at a national member state level. The danger if you were to say, okay, let's create an EU wide um, capital market specific court is that in seven years time, we will have an announcement from the European Commission saying that this court has now gone live. It will look nothing like the court that was proposed in the original white paper it will have gone through the mangle of uh, the EU policymaking machine, by which time member states will have moved on. And I think the key thing I've taken away from the other three contributions so far today has been this idea that if the EU could play more of a role in showcasing and helping develop and share best practice, that would probably achieve more in CMU than trying to harmonize everything. To be clear, I, I absolutely believe there is a role for harmonization in certain areas. You look at examples like USIT, so it's a perfect example of successful EU harmonization, creating a structure that has become a global standard. So but there's, have... there's a danger of going too far down there. We can solve all of this just by harmonizing everything. Sure, but should the EU put forward a capital markets court best practices and encourage every single member state to set up a capital markets court? Um, I, I would, uh, my ignorance, I'm afraid, I, I don't know how many you know, are there other member states that have one. And if if Poland has a, cap, a dedicated specialist capital markets court and it works, then yeah, there should be more of a forum, more of a mechanism for sharing that best practice. Why does it work? How does it work? How can we transplant what works here in this member state to other member states? It, we, we've done a, a lot of work on, on, on which markets have the sort of are, are best in class in different sectors. We're not pretending for a moment that just because the Netherlands has 40%, more than 40% of all EU pensions assets, that you could just copy and paste the Dutch pension system and apply it to Poland or Germany or France. Um, but which elements of it could you? take and which elements could you transplant uh, onto other national systems? Thanks. Heather Jenna, what can you tell us? Well, <laughs> thank you. And uh, I feel very obliged to clarify that the court is not yet there. So establ the establishment of the court is part of our strategy and, uh, and an important part. Uh, and we, uh, once we do, once we set it up and uh, it becomes operational, we'll, we will let you know uh, how it went and share all the experiences. So we will keep you posted. Uh, but if I may just quickly um, add to that, I think these are all incredibly spot on points. And I, the, the way I like to think about the CMU is this sort of um, a radar for us, this, this sort of high level, great beautiful idea that uh, European capital markets should act together in order to to become more competitive more supportive of the European economy etc cetera, etc cetera. but I think also um, over years we've uh, this beautiful idea has also has somewhat turned into a very technic technically technical um, project full of regulating infrastructure, new transparency requirements, et cetera, which are all incredibly important. But the, I think the big question is, um, 
where do we see the CMU going? If you talk to international investors, international issuers, what they tell you is, well, if you need a lot of capital for your great idea, uh, you go to New York. Uh, if you need commodities trading, you go to Chicago. Um, if you need uh, world-class financial services, you go to London. Um, and I think the big question for us is, what do, what do we want people to come to Europe for? I don't have a good question, good answer to that question. Maybe William has, he's laughing. Uh, but, uh, but I also think that, um, again, incredibly important point made, uh, made by William and, and Orban and Kolya indeed, um, of maybe we can think of how we can turn something we were used to think about our, um, the negative side of EU, which is the sort of polycentric financial center, and we can think how, how we could turn that into, or leverage that and turn it into our advantage. There are, uh, there are great things happening in local capital markets, bigger and smaller within the EU. And uh, I think the, um, the, the way to make that work would be for the EU regulation to sort of cherish that and try to, try to, try to turn it into our advantage. Uh, what do I mean by that? Make it a little, make the regulation a bit more proportional. So capital markets such as Poland uh, can develop, um, make, uh, make the regulation, try to make the best out of those markets. So those who want to turn into FinTech can do that. Those who want to focus on sustainability and promoting climate transition can do that. Uh, perhaps this is the way to go. Thanks very much for that. Um, while we've got you here, I also wanted to follow up about the increased pension opportunities you were mm. mentioning coming up in Poland. At Bruegel, I'm about to publish, possibly later today, with a couple of colleagues, um, a study on pensions for self-employed people. And we found that in Poland, as well as most of the other countries we looked at, there aren't as many regulatory offerings available, at least subsidized offerings for self-employed as there are for traditional employees. And I'm wondering just if you could share your thinking on that and if there's a way to try and get more of that capital involved. Because without the, the co-contribution, self-employed people don't have the same resources and aren't able to put the same amount of capital. Sometimes they even have lower limits on what they can invest, even if they have the money. Well, I, I think the the program that we've set up a couple of years ago, uh, you're you're very right. Uh, it's it's focused on the employees, uh, but I think these are early years, and what we're seeing is this increasing participation into the program as as people see uh, that their uh, savings are really working working for their to their benefit, and um, I think yes, uh, part of that interest. Uh, is uh, attributed to the fact that there is this government bonus and there is a bonus from your employer when you decide to join. But I think uh, there is, a, a, as we can see already in the statistics on the, um, on the sort of successes of the program, uh, you can already see that uh, even without those bonuses, it already uh, it already really works uh, works for people who are um, who are part of it, and uh, it really uh, turns their savings into great investments. So I think there is still a case to be made there that um, these types of uh, mechanisms should be uh, rolled out also to self-employed people. Uh, and really, the bonus is not uh, the only way to sort of um, convince them that it is really worth joining them, these types of mechanisms. Thanks for that. Orban, I'd like to ask you about the euro area versus the non-euro area. You mentioned very convincingly in your opening remarks that there's a lot that member states can do without having to harmonize. Um, Sweden, of course, has chosen not to join the euro area. So I guess my question is, do you see or could you see a capital markets union being like banking union where there's more cooperation within the euro area and then more sort of parallel play from, from non-euro countries? Or where do you think that could be going? Well, I think a quite a common mistake from the early beginning is that, uh, you know, we compare bank, the banking market with the cap with capital markets, uh, I mean, when it comes to banking, and I was in, in in Brussels during the banking union negotiations. I mean, there are lots of differences, of course, between different banking systems, but there are lots of similarities uh, 
as well when it comes to supervision and the, the, the line of business they are in, etc. Capital markets are much more different. So I, I think it no, I think it doesn't, and you can see, of course, that you have some uh, capital markets like the Swedish one, uh, where we are outside of the euro area. Uh, you have some capital markets in the EU area uh, or non-euro area that are not as developed. You know, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I think when it comes to Sweden not being in the euro, I think, you know, from time to time it's been good. At times it hasn't been that good. You know, it has. Also, from a securities markets perspective, there are some downsides in being a, a very small currency market as well when it comes to government bonds, et cetera, et cetera. And also being outside of the euro area may mean that some uh, euro fund, euro denominated funds divest of stocks in the Swedish market, uh, you know, as soon as uh, there is some turbulence uh, on the market. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure if, um, that is, uh, but I, I think, it, you know, it depends on other things. I think it depends on the level of kind of a entrepreneurial spirit or whatever. Uh, but I think what, what Karasin also says with, with kind of investments and, and pension savings, I think to a large extent, we have focused during the last 10, 15 years on consumer protection. Uh, so we are at the point where we now provide uh, consumers, retail clients with 20 page documents, and we all know that they are not reading them. I'm not reading them. Uh, and, you know, in an IPO in Germany, you know, the IPO prospectuses may run to five, six, seven hundred pages. You know, it's a full kind of disclosure document. No one, no retail investor will ever read it. But I'm quite sure if something happens to that company, there will be a disclaimer or kind of a text in there that gets kind of the banker off the hook. Uh, I mean, by comparison, IPO prospectuses in Sweden are normally like 100 to 150 pages, meaning that when we responded to the uh, simplified listing requirements consultation, my members didn't really know where to shorten the text because it's only essential text in there. So I think we have but I think we, as we're talking so much about risks uh, and we all, always in Europe see, I don't know, it may be because all of our risk takers, uh, grandfathers and grandmothers moved to America. I don't know, uh, but uh, we need to look at the upside. I mean, as you say, with the pension investments, uh, for example, I mean, if you invest in a startup, it may turn into gold. And uh, I think there is always room for a good local market Again, I think Sweden had like 140 listings or so last year. Most of them were SMEs. And the investment bank I worked for was a regional investment bank. And while we did work together with Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley on the, on the big deals, we had lots of SMEs that wouldn't be interesting to you know, uh, investors outside of Sweden. So it's still, uh, you know, it's really important to build the local regional investor base because once you have that interest you know like in poland they may well look at at um, uh, you know listed companies elsewhere in the region in sectors that they know of etc so i think we need to to look at the end and one really important point is that once you have this part of the ecosystem uh, i mean when i talk to my my son who's studying engineering Mm -hmm. You know, in his world, he can absolutely see himself doing a startup, going to the stock market, becoming a billionaire, or start working for Ericsson. You know, it's really an alternative. So we, we mustn't forget the signals, this sense, the opportunities uh, for, for young people to start SMEs. And we're talking a lot about SMEs, and, and, and uh, but we're not really looking at how they finance themselves as not all countries are kind of in the fortunate position as you are in Germany, for example, where SMEs can get bank financing through local banks. Uh, I think Swedish banks may be a bit risk avert. So it may actually be easier for a, a young person to get financing through a business angel or, or, or go to the stock exchange. Thanks for that. We have about 
20 minutes, maybe a, a tad less left in our panel. I'd uh, love to encourage you in the audience to put your questions in the Q&A. We've got one going. Um, before we move to that audience question, I have a follow-up for Kolya, which is, you mentioned in your opening remarks, you talked about the importance of financial literacy. You talked about the importance of getting people used to investing. And I, I'd like you to follow up on that in terms of risk-taking. Um, there's certainly in, in Germany and many EU countries, there's a sense that even in these very low interest rate environments, people still are very scared about putting their money at risk. They complain about the low returns, but then they don't really want to put the money at risk. So we've just heard from Orban about the risk taking on the entrepreneurial side, but what about the risk taking on the investment side? And then if I can shoehorn in a little bit about pensions as well, um, is there a way to, to channel that, that risk taking and financial literacy into something like the EU PEP or some other sort of, of cross-border pension initiative? Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, actually, the problem always is that there's so much happening that uh, if you see seeing actually positive developments, um, they are again uh, um, also also shaking. If you look actually at the, the securities markets, uh, there was quite a good movement actually from some savers going to the capital markets due to the low interest rates. But actually now, you due to the to, due to the war, we are we are having issues again. So um, it's 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 difficult. But as I said, particularly the younger people are looking at the options and are more actually um, uh, prepared to, 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 to invest, in, invest in the capital markets. And um, what, what we think, um, and this was also mentioned earlier, which is, which is necessary, we were talking actually about this complementary approach of uh, member states activities, but also actually harmonization uh, initiatives on EU level. Um, both is necessary, so I don't want to be misunderstood. So we are very strong defenders of EU harmonization in fields where it is actually reasonable. So securitization would be actually one field where we would uh, actually uh, agree and also ask for a EU framework. And uh, this is, as it was mentioned by Urban, actually what uh, banks can uh, play, uh, or what role do banks play in this, in this field? And this is, of course, an important tool uh, to bridge, actually, uh, to build a bridge between bank lending and uh, the capital markets. And uh, we are closely, uh, we are working closely together, actually, also with uh, our uh, French colleagues and Italian colleagues on, on, on ways how we could actually go for reform of uh, the securitization framework. And um, up to now, the Commission is still hesitant to start the review and the review, but we think it is, it is, it is necessary. And um, to, to, to work on actually transparency rules uh, on risk rates and, and also, also other issues um, so um, there's there's a lot uh, there's a lot to be done um, and on your on your last question uh, on these uh, pan european pension products um, it's 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 difficult i think the idea is not new uh, they wanted to introduce it uh, years ago and you could do it actually not only in the field of course of pension products uh, you could actually also try uh, to to uh, find other pan-European services for retail uh, clients, but um, there are still too many issues around. It's actually tax issues. It's it's a language issue. It's um, uh, if you look actually at investments with the insolvency law field, where we would also say actually it is uh, it, if if you want to change the insolvency law, you should start actually with the civil law. And, sure, and, we're, we're just talking about that with the capital market courts and it, it, it brings yeah. us around. Um, we have 15 minutes left, which is time for, I think, one more tour de table. Um, and we have two really excellent questions from the floor that don't have a lot in common with each other other than the general topic. So I'm going to read them both and then I'm going to ask each of our panelists to try and come in at two or three minutes. You can address one 
or both, um, but don't feel obligated to touch on both. But we do need to try and cover some ground in the time we have left. And they're, they're both really good questions. So one of the questions is asking about strategic autonomy. On the one hand, we're looking at it at the EU level. On the other hand, we have member states still wondering what do they have you know, with national champion systems or economies of scale, home host concerns, are you being taken advantage of in some way or another? Um, so is there is there some idea that this will lead to resistance or, or maybe soft resistance to a lot of these cross-border initiatives? So that's one question at the member state level. And then the other question goes back to this issue that we've had in the EU for a long time of debt financing versus equity financing. There's different tax treatment. There's different levels of perceived government subsidy. If something goes wrong, the banks are perceived to be in line to get bailed out, whereas capital markets are perceived to be more at risk, even if the, the actual risk levels turn out differently. So what can we do there to give equity financing more of a leg up? Those are the two questions, um, member state strategic autonomy and then debt versus equity financing. Um, William, I'm gonna give you the first word and then after everybody else is gone, I'm gonna come back to you for the last word. And with that, we'll go through. I'm gonna try not to talk much from here out. Okay. Um, thank you. And thank you to Michael and to Hans for two very good questions. Uh, on the... Um, the issue around strategic autonomy and the extent to which smaller member states may feel that CMU is uh, an exercise uh, for larger member states to sort of exercise and exert their power. I think that's that's not unreasonable based on the development of CMU so far. Certainly the first few years of CMU, it was very much seen as a big boys club. Uh, 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 it, was a, it was a project for big, wealthy, well-developed uh, economies. Um, I think that's changed, I think, and, and, and is continuing to change. Uh, and I think one example I would point to, uh, Urban, which, which is sort of related to, 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 to the Swedish market, is the way in which the Baltic states have come together uh, through um, the NASDAQ uh, exchange uh, and, and common market infrastructure and working together on the Baltic common capital market project. Um, that it doesn't need to be like that. The, the, the point is that the big member states, the industry, the EU, I think need to make a much better, clearer case as to what CM, what benefits CMU could bring to every member state, not just to big member states. On debt equity, Hans, it's, it's a question after my own heart. Um, in a perfect world, uh, if I could only do one thing, I would abolish the differential tax treatment between debt and equity. Um, but I think that would have some knock-on effects, and I'm not sure Kolya would entirely agree with me uh, on doing that. Um, but there are ways in which we can address it, and, and uh, Belgium has already uh, has already tried with a notional interest deduction approach. Italy recently introduced an allocation for corporate equity. Um, the Belgian case study has been widely seen. I think there was a research paper from BIS pointed out that it had a dramatic effect on the shift uh, the shift in liabilities and court capital structure uh, of Belgian companies. Uh, and I think you, absolutely the differential treatment is, a, is an issue, particularly in this sort of systemically, structurally low interest rate environment. One way of addressing that might be to sit back and wait for interest rates to normalize, uh, and then equity finance will become in relative terms more attractive. But I think there is an opportunity for member states individually to get on the front foot and address this themselves. Let's go the other way around on the way back. Koya. You're muted. So this is actually the old mistake. <laughs> now, um, um, I'm, I was just looking at the ch uh, uh, chat and, and there are more questions also coming on, which, which, which are coming in, which are also, also interesting. Uh, in, in particular, if you look also, at this question on strategic autonomy, um, we are of the opinion that it is uh, very, very good that uh, this discussion was started already some years ago, because we are of the opinion that it is necessary that uh, the EU has also its own infrastructures in financial services, but also looking at the digitalization um, that uh, we uh, are able actually also on EU level 
um, to have the choice, actually. This doesn't mean actually to build up walls or something, but actually to have the choice. And that's why uh, it's, 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 it's good that, that, we are, that we are having this, uh, this discussion. And um, well, um, there is this, there is, uh, uh, this third question about uh, financial centers. We're going to come back to that at the end. I would love okay. it if you could answer William's point about debt versus equity. Yeah, you can imagine that I have a slightly different <laughs> uh, uh, approach, although um, uh, uh, yeah, subsidizing banks, it's, it's, it's a question. I mean, we are seeing uh, how much banks are now paying also for all these mechanisms, uh, be it the resolution mechanism with the fund, which is exploding also due to the rise of deposits. Um, uh, looking at the debate actually on, on, on EDIS and, and possible new funds. So you have all these mechanisms now in place and it's in the end the banks uh, actually paying for banks uh, which, 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 which are causing, causing issues. We see that actually on all also national markets and these mechanisms are working. Uh, they are working well. You could see also during the COVID crisis that we didn't have any stability issues left. So I would say we, we did our homework well. So that justifies getting better tax treatment on a loan? <laughs> Now that's that's of course a fair question, uh, but actually what I wanted to say is is that uh, it's not like that that we are by, by, bought out by the by the states all the time. It's it's not anymore the case. Okay, Orvan, um, strategic autonomy, and also um, if you have any thoughts on debt versus equity, they're welcome. Well, first of all, I mean, when it comes to strategic autonomy, absolutely. I mean, having represented Sweden in the council, uh, you know, I think William could have written my notes at the time when I defended kind of the small and medium sized countries versus Germany, uh, France and the UK as it was, uh, because I think a large, uh, many of the rules were written for the large players uh, without any thought at all. Uh, to how this was perceived by smaller and kind of developing uh, member states. So I think there, there is absolutely, and, and it comes back to this, do, again, how do you sell kind of a pan-European project in Poland or in Romania or whatever, uh, you know, that's coming to you from abo above from institutions that you haven't heard of? I don't think that will work actually. Um, I mean, the, you know, you have pan-European players doing an excellent job, you know, providing mutual investment funds, et cetera. But that being said, we have to do some more kind of work on the ground. Uh, then I think, you know, when it comes, you know, yeah, I mean, you will always have uh, economies of scale, like in clearing. As you all know, I mean, we, Sweden may not be the country that is most concerned about clearing being in London. Uh, and as we have a French king, you know, we may not be that concerned about it if it were to be, be in Paris either. But, you know, it's a fact. And we have a small clearing house in Stockholm as well. But I mean, there are risks as well. You know, it's not the, the most kind of profitable uh, business around that it does carry risks. And then when it comes to uh, kind of the banking, again, I see banks as part of the equation. Again, not either or. On the contrary, I, I, I mean, the Swedish Securities Markets Association, and we would like banks, for example, to have, um, uh, you know, better rules for, for on capital requirements, for example, for market making, because on the one hand, we would like banks to take on more risks in their trading books. On the other hand, we punish them by imposing capital requirements, uh, you know, uh, if they do market make. Uh, I think, uh, so I think it has to be both. And of course, it will always be more expensive for corporates to have share capital than it will be, you know, bank loans. But they need the share capital in order to use it to, to buy, you know, as, as a risk buffer, to buy other companies, and also to connect with investors. You know, if you, if you have a small uh, SME in a market with, you know, 20,000 investors, that will also be your customer base. So uh, to finally, I think it's a bigger problem when you look at how you treat bonds versus shares, where I think bonds, you know, government bonds, for example, get 
better tax treatment than stocks in some member states. I, I think that's more of a problem. Uh, but that is, of course, also because governments would like investors to invest in their bonds. Um, that is a fascinating question, particularly when you look at risk weighting and how one looks at the comparative riskiness of public versus privately issued securities. Um, as an aside, I, I love the way the monarchy plays into issues of popular support across Europe, all these different monarchies we have. It's just fascinating. Um, Katarzyna, we've had a, you've heard a lot of things go by. What would you like to talk about in your last two minutes on the floor? Well, if I have two minutes, uh, per perhaps I can address the last questions that, that, that appeared in the Q&A. No, window. no, because the last question, I will tell everyone what the last question is. The last question is, should European policymakers support one financial center as a global hub? And the answer from all of the panelists so far already is no. And I don't <laughs> want to spend our last three minutes going through that again. We've already described the beauty of everything. I will ask William to address the benefits of a multipolar, multi-hub EU at the end, but I am much more interested in your thoughts on some of these other things, debt versus equity and strategic autonomy, because there's much more disagreement there and that's what's fun. Well, on the strategic economy, I must say I'm probably <laughs> not the best person to ask, given that in <laughs> Poland, there's actually a lot of something I call uh, yeah. home bias. <laughs> So for many reasons, uh, Polish consumers in the financial market simply love Polish institutions, Polish infrastructure. So we rely on our own exchange, our own CCP, uh, our own uh, funds. This is especially visible in the investment fund uh, market. So from the Polish perspective, we're more, more in the position on of trying to um, render financial services to our other countries and, uh, and markets in the CEE region. However, um, I think the strategic autonomy is, is a very relevant question for, uh, for capital markets union, for the EU, and we should not fool ourselves that uh, you know, relying on uh, relying on outside um, relying on outside uh, uh, service uh, providers, um, it puts us in a competitive position. And, but I, and so this is, I think, quite uh, quite obvious. The the less obvious uh, question that I'm asking myself, and uh, and I think a question to ask is how do we get. Uh, from where we are now towards that strategic economy. Do we get there? And this com comes back to sort of our initial discussion at the beginning of today's panel. Do we do it by more regulatory initiatives, by uh, imposing new, uh, new obligations on companies, by, uh, by putting that into some beautiful initiative that in only seven years will be there and will, will, will really deliver on our objectives? Or do we do it starting by actually mobilizing more uh, bigger pools, pools of capital, um, making that in those investments flow and trying to take this sort of bottom up approach. If there are bigger pools of capital, uh, that capital will want to, will want to find um, a, a way to be invested. And on that, we can, uh, we can then um, start building that strategic economy. Oh, Thank you so much. That is, to me, very helpful thinking about the formulation of big pools of capital and trying to have capital markets that are big enough to be interesting mm -hmm. to them. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for showing up, reading the report, getting the report. William, the last word is yours. Thank you. I'm going to address that third question that I'm not allowed to address. There are two guaranteed ways, in my view, to ensure that we do not have a capital markets union or uh, to ensure that we don't have bigger and better capital markets uh, in Europe. The first is to try to create a single European financial centre for everyone uh, that, would, uh, that would smother or, 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 or suffocate smaller local financial centres. So that's route one, guaranteed failure. Route two, guaranteed failure. Every single financial centre in Europe tries to be a mini version of every other financial centre in Europe. Guaranteed failure as well, uh, because of the inefficiencies involved. If there is one benefit from Brexit, from a capital markets, financial markets perspective, I think it may be that we're beginning to see the emergence of these sort of specialist hubs. Most of the trading and options and broking community that have relocated from London 
Most of those relocations have gone to Amsterdam. Most of the funds have gone to Dublin. Most of the alternatives have gone to Luxembourg. Most of the banks to, 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 uh, to Frankfurt. Um, and then there's only Paris, which is sort of a mini everything financial center. And I think if we can continue down that route of specialist hubs for pan-European activity and dedicated local markets to support high growth potential companies uh, and local companies, that in my view is the route to success with Capital Markets Union. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you to the City of London for hosting. We'll see you next time.